Uh, I'm uh, so glad to meet you again. I, I can add talk. So it's Friday 8 o'clock in Beijing. So welcome everyone, no matter where you are, no matter what time you are. So I can add talks, connect the world and the universe is online right now. So this is Alice from Beijing. And uh, uh, everyone knows that I can ask talks already many, many weeks, many, many Fridays. So today is our 20, you know, uh, our uh, 61, you know, weeks. So in this July, we have uh, five speakers. Uh, t today, we will have a Joanna statue. Next week, we'll have a Yuri. So this will be a very exciting, you know, month for I can ask talks. So uh, actually, before we uh, came to this wonderful talk, you know, to Johanna, let me introduce our team this week. So we have uh, Professor Johanna is a speaker. He's going to tell us the stories, you know, of the huge equipment, how to exploring all these kind of matters from a big bang. And uh, we have our, you know, moderator uh, is from uh, Australia as Professor Mena. And we have our panelists, Zhu Jin and Hui Chao, and also our challenger is Bao Qi Fu, was from Peking University. So that's a very strong team, and it's a very big weekend. So we're looking forward to all this wonderful talk. So let me first introduce our, you know, moderator today. Everyone see Professor Mana, uh, Mahananda was uh, from uh, uh, Australian National University. He's a very uh, nice professor, you know, was doing experimental, you know, uh, physics in Australia. He's very famous. He's also the academic of Australia, you know, science academy. Uh, she done a lot of, uh, you know, wonderful works, and he also win a lot of, uh, you know, wonderful honors. So today is our great pleasure to have Mena to be our moderator. So Mena, uh, I hope you're here to introduce Professor Statue, please. Uh, yes, I can hear you, please. Lionel Fellow in 1982 and subsequently was as an, in Stony Brook as physics faculty until 1995. Since 1996, she took up a chair of experimental physics at Heidelberg University between 20, 2003 and 20, 2012. She was dean and then vice dean of the faculty of physics and astronomy there. She was the first female president of the 65,000 member German Physical Society and that she was the president during 2012 to 2014. Scientifically, Professor Strachel is exploring the quark gluon plasma, a phase of strongly interacting matter that existed in the early universe and can be created in the laboratory in collisions of highly energetic nuclei. She had an important role in the construction of the ALICE experiment at the Large Hadron Collider and serves in important managing functions now. She also made seminal contributions to the phenomenology of this field and for her work she has received numerous awards and I mean numerous uh, and medals and she is a member of several very prestigious academies. So with that I'll give, uh, I'll ask Joanna to please give her a talk on exploring Big Bang matter with collisions of heavy nuclei at the Large Hadron Collider. Joanna. Okay, Nanda, thank you very much for this kind introduction and uh, thank you, Alice, for the opportunity of speaking in this prestigious uh, series of talks. So I'm very happy to tell you today how we are going to explore Big Bang matter in the laboratory. 
and um, we will take a journey back from the universe as it is today, 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang, uh, the universe has cooled to about 3 Kelvin, and we will take a journey back in time to a phase that existed microseconds after the Big Bang, femtoseconds to microseconds. So, so what do we know about the Big Bang at all? The experimental or, or observational evidence uh, is the Hubble expansion. We have the cosmic microwave radiation, which tells us a lot about the history of the universe. Um, we have the element synthesis in the early universe in the first few minutes. Uh, of course, also the formation of galaxies and extended structures uh, carries information about fluctuations in the very early universe. And last but not least, the creation of a state of matter that you will know much more about at the end of my lecture, the quark-gluon matter, will take us back even earlier in the history of the universe. So nature took its course from the Big Bang over various steps of evolution, atomic nuclei, atoms, galaxies, and so on. And what we do in the laboratory, we try to take this journey back for a very short time. And um, this is what this whole story is about. So, so how far back can we actually trace the Big Bang. I already mentioned the Hubble expansion uh, that stars and galaxies are receiving from each other with a velocity that grows linearly with the distance. And uh, this is, uh, of course, requires that there are even galaxies and stars around. Uh, we have the cosmic microwave background radiation uh, that decoupled when neutral atoms formed in the early universe. This was at about um, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. The universe had cooled to a temperature of 3,000 Kelvin. Um, and uh, this era after that we call matter dominated. Uh, then I told you we can observe nuclei that were formed in the first few minutes in the first three minutes after the Big Bang and the, the abundances we see of these light elements like hydrogen, uh, helium, the tiny bit of lithium-7, uh, this stems from this period between seconds and, and minutes in the early universe. And today we take a step back at the time uh, about 10 microseconds after the Big Bang, an era ended that was dominated by uh, quarks and gluons and um, photons, electrons, neutrino. And this era existed between what is called the electroweak phase transition, when we had a temperature, and I will come to this scale in a few minutes, a temperature of about 150 MeV and the time of about 10 to the minus 11 seconds, 10 picoseconds after the Big Bang up to microseconds. So what you will learn about is how we study this period in the evolution of the early universe in the laboratory. And I first have to tell you a little bit about the fundamental ingredients of matter so that you can appreciate the type of matter that we are studying in our experiments. So we have the atom. All matter is made out of atoms. Atoms bind into, into molecules. They, they crystallize and so on. And the scale of the atom is uh, Ongström or 10 to the 10, 10 to the minus 10 meters. Um, the atom you know, is composed of an atomic nucleus that is surrounded by electrons, and the atomic nucleus is about a factor 10,000 smaller. The biggest atomic nuclei are about a factor 10,000 smaller than the size of the atom. And uh, the atomic nucleus is composed itself of protons and neutrons. The proton and the neutron are about a tenth of the size of the atomic nucleus in, in their radial 
uh, extent. And uh, we know since a bit more than 50 years that also protons and neutrons are not fundamental particles, but they are composed. They are composed of quarks and held, these quarks are held together by gluons. And I will tell you a little bit more what you need to know for this talk about quarks and, and gluons next. So let's start with the quarks. We have six types of quarks. They have interesting names, up, down, charm, and strange, and bottom. Sometimes it's also called beauty and top. And uh, they differ in several properties, which are not important for this talk. But in particular, they also differ in their mass. There are small masses for the up and down quarks, and then bigger masses here, up to very big masses here. And these masses are measured in a unit you may not be familiar with. And I want to explain what this unit electron volt or mega electron volt is. So, so it is related to the way particles are accelerated. And in particular, one electron volt is the kinetic energy of a proton or any singly charged particle after traversing the potential difference of one volt. So a singly charged particle traverses a potential difference of one volt. It has a kinetic energy of one electron volt. And higher energies are just reached by putting many batteries, many few volt batteries, one after another, or by traversing a much bigger potential difference, for instance, a million volt many times. And if you do this, then you come to uh, many million or billion or trillion electron volts in energy. And uh, since Einstein, we know that mass and energy are equivalent. You can transform one into the other. Right? The famous equation E is mc squared, mass times velocity of light squared. And that means also masses are given in energy units um, in electron volts or in mega electron volts. And to give you some examples, uh, the electron is, has a mass of 0.5 mega electron volts, half a mega electron volt. The proton has a mass of one giga electron volts, so 10 to the 9, or 1,000 million electron volts, 1 billion electron volts. This is it, the GeV. Uh, the lead nucleus is about 200 times that mass. And uh, you see also the mass of the famous Higgs boson is on that scale, 125, and the lead nucleus is 200. And uh, since also energy and temperature are equivalent, if you multiply temperature with the Boltzmann constant, it's an energy. Uh, we express also temperatures in units of electron volts. And so the temperature, for instance, in the, in the typical room is one fortieth of an electron volt. The temperature of the universe today, if you measure anywhere in the, in the universe, uh, it is 2.4 times 10 to the minus 4 electron volts. The temperature in the interior of the sun is 1.3 kilo electron volts, so 1300 electron volts. And the temperature that it will be interesting in, in this talk, the temperature that melts nuclear matter is about 0.16 giga electron volts or 150 mega electron volts. That is a number that will come back a few times in this talk. Now, uh, we know what the electron volt is. Now we can look at these quarks again. And I have here the mass in MeV. And so the up and down quark, they are just a few mega electron volts. And the heaviest quark, the top quark, this has a mass that is of a similar scale as a heavy nucleus, for instance, a gold nucleus. Uh, 
In addition to these six quarks, we have the corresponding antiparticles, or so six antiquarks, and the interaction between the quarks is mediated by the gluons. The gluons are holding the quarks together. What is drawn here like a little spring is gluons that are thrown back and forth, exchanged between quarks, and this is what is binding the quarks together. Now, there is one more thing I have to explain to you about quarks and gluons, and, and then we can come to the heart of the matter. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, so these quarks carry one of three possible colors or color charges. So we have three colors. The, the six quarks can either be come in a blue or a green or a red color, and the corresponding antiquarks have an anticolor. Now, anticolor is of course a bit hard to imagine. It's just like for a positive charge, the anti is a negative charge. And it means if you put a color and an anticolor together, they add up to something that is white or color neutral. And the gluons that mediate between quarks, in fact, they have a color and an anticolor, and there are eight different types, but we don't really need this uh, today. Now, there is a very important uh, fact uh, that is still somewhat mysterious in how it comes about, and that is that quarks do not occur free in nature. This is something that is called confinement. The quarks are confined, and they are confined or bound by the strong interaction into colorless hadrons. So a hadron, and that term will come back a few times in my talk, a hadron is a bound state of quarks. And this is the only way quarks occur in nature. And there are two ways uh, to do this, to make a colorless object. You can either take three quarks of three different colors, and you know that if you add all colors in the spectrum, uh, the light is white or colorless, and it's the same in the strong interaction. So we can have three quarks, for instance, in a proton, we have two up quarks and a down quark, or in a neutron, we have two down quarks and an up quark, and they have three different colors, and the mass of a proton or a neutron is about 1,000 MeV or 1 GeV. Now, the other way quarks can bind is that you can bind a quark and an antiquark together, and these particles are called mesons, quark and an antiquark of a color and an anticolor. And of course, you can make all possible combinations between the different quarks and antiquarks. And we know about 150 different mesons and equally many about 150 different baryons that are made up of the different quarks. And um, Yes, I already mentioned the example of the proton and the neutron. So now, now that we know the fundamental constituents of matter and we know how they are bound in nature by the confinement into hadrons, uh, I can start to explain to you what this quark gluon plasma is. The quark gluon plasma is a macroscopic state of thousands of quarks and gluons. And now we can ask ourselves how we achieve this. Uh, we start out with an atomic nucleus that is made of protons and neutrons. And then we can either buy heat, and how much heat you will see uh, soon, or by very large pressure, we can reach a state where not the individual protons and neutrons matter anymore, but we have quarks that over a sizable volume, either hot or cold, can move about freely. And both the heating and the pressure are achieved in collisions of heavy atomic nuclear ion 
So this is how we make this crop grown matter by uh, heating or strongly compressing matter. Now, oops, that was a bit quick. Uh, what you see here is um, the so-called phase diagram of strongly interacting matter. And we have one axis here, that is the temperature. I have put here the only time in this talk you will see Kelvin so that I can you can translate temperature in units of mega electron volt to, to Kelvin. And here is the density. And the density in a normal atomic nucleus would be here. And these are densities that are a few times the density of an atomic nucleus. And what I'm telling you is that up to a certain temperature and up to a certain density, we live in the normal world where we are surrounded by the hadrons that we know. And if we go beyond a critical value, we come into a new phase of matter. And that is the spore gluon plasma. It is called plasma because we have the quarks and the gluons moving unbound, like in a plasma, you have atomic nuclei and electrons. And the temperature scale here is about 200,000 times the temperature in the interior of the sun. Now, how can we imagine what happens when we collide atomic nuclei at high energies? So before the collision, the two nuclei will approach each other at very large velocities. I will come to that in a second. Uh, the density is the density we have in an atomic nucleus, about uh, one sixth of a nucleon per cubic femtometer. If you look at them in the laboratory, uh, because they move at such large velocity, they're very strongly Lorentz contracted. It looks really like two flat pancakes are approaching each other. Then when the nuclei hit each other, we have a phase of strong compression and heating. Then this quark gluon plasma is formed. We have what we call a fireball, a very hot object. The creation is expected at densities that are about five, six times the density of normal nuclear matter and energy densities that are accordingly also a factor five to six times larger. And the, if you translate this energy into a temperature, it is 160 MeV or 0.16 GeV. And how we know this, you will learn in this talk. Uh, of course, nothing is holding this fireball together, so it will expand and cool because it has a very high internal pressure, it will strongly expand. And I will show you evidence of this a little later. And uh, eventually the particles will not interact anymore. They will reach our observation system, our detectors, and we can measure them. This is what we call freeze out. Now the uh, accelerator where we perform these experiments is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN near Geneva. And what you see here, the most prominent feature, this is Geneva Airport. And the circle that is drawn here, uh, of course, you don't see if you make a photo from an airplane, it is underground. But this indicates where and how large the Large Hadron Collider is. It is close to Geneva Airport, and part of it is underneath Switzerland, and the, the bigger part is actually underneath uh, France. Now, in the Large Hadron Collider, protons and nuclei are accelerated to super high velocities. And what I mean with super high velocities is when light and protons make a race around the LHC ring. Light, of course, travels at the speed of light, that's three times 10 to the eight meter per second. And so if light and the protons make a race around the LHC ring, which is, two, which is 27 kilometers in circumference, then light wins by 0.2 millimeter. 
So that is what I mean with super high velocities, very close to the velocity of light. And the, the kinetic energy these protons have is 77 tera electron volt or 7 trillion electron volts. And with this energy, new things can be created. So if we have collisions at the LHC, then the particles come in bunches. All around the ring, you have 2,800 bunches of protons circulating, 10 to the 11 protons in one of these bunches, and each bunch has the dimension of about a hair, human hair. Uh, so they are about 20 centimeters long and uh, 20 micrometer in diameter, and they are seven and a half meter stacked behind each other, and 200 uh, 1,400 travel in one direction and 1,400 travel in the other direction. And then at four points in the accelerator tunnel, they are brought to collision. So these bunches that have the dimensions of a hair are steered precisely enough that they hit each other. And then in the collision, the energy is transformed into new particles and into heat. And we observe these collisions at the four points where they happen with uh, specially designed equipment. Uh, and this equipment, this is what we call experiments. So, so the biggest technological challenge for, for the accelerator, for the Large Hadron Collider construction was that it consists of many superconducting magnets. For instance, it contains the 1232 superconducting dipole magnets, which uh, achieve magnetic fields up to 8.4 Tesla. And the, the blue objects you see here are such dipole magnets. Um, uh, the accelerator is operated at uh, liquid helium temperature, so that uh, we have superconducting magnets. And uh, this is the largest liquid helium plant in the world. There are 700,000 liters of liquid helium at a temperature of 1.9 Kelvin. So this is also superfluid distributed around these 27 kilometers. And uh, of course, nothing should get lost because uh, the amount of helium we have on Earth is limited. If it, escapes uh, the experiment, it also escapes our atmosphere. Um, the uh, accelerator elements, of course, all had to be brought down and installed. So there were five magnets per night could be uh, installed and then connected over the day. And you can imagine that this process takes quite a while. So. The whole accelerator construction was uh, finished 15 years after the production of the superconducting cable for the magnet started. And you see here a, a view uh, looking into the LHC the tunnel. You see that there are also uh, more complicated the structures, not only these dipole magnets. And what you see here uh, schematically is the accelerator is underground. It is about in some places 50 meters, in some places 100 meters underground. And here marked are the four positions where the beams are brought into collision. And then up on the, on the surface, uh, there, there are a few buildings uh, so that uh, this is the experimental counting rooms. I'll show you a, a view in a second. But the experiment that observes the collision is deep underground. Now, what happens when we bring these protons of seven tera electron volts uh, into collision? There's, of course, a lot of energy stored into these beams. Each of the two colliding beams has the total kinetic energy of a, of a ICE, German high-speed train, uh, that travels with 150 kilometers an hour. So 350 megajoule is the energy that is stored in each of the two beams that are racing towards each other. 
but in the collisions, only the smallest part of the energy is released. By and large, the beams pass through each other and only 10 parts in a trillion of this energy is released when the beams are hitting each other. Now, the energy that is stored in the superconducting magnets is, is much, much bigger. This is 10 gigajoules. So this is the energy of an uh, Airbus uh, flying with 700 kilometers an hour. And that means you have to be very careful in operating the accelerator that this energy is not released. Huh? Now, um, even in a single collision of two nuclei at the LHC, the energy release is macroscopic. So for instance, two lead nuclei colliding, I uh, have picked here the energy that we had in the first year, 2.76 TeV. Uh, this translates into, if you go to Joule, which many of you may be more familiar to an energy of 0.2 millijoule. So, so this is 5,800 times bigger than the mass of the colliding nuclei. And in fact, you could hear even one single collision if it would not happen in vacuum. But of course, in vacuum, you know that there is no sound wave. So, so we cannot hear the bang you would hear if the collision was not in vacuum. And with these high energies, for the first time, one has access to really new physics. We can access length scales or resolve length scales down to 10 to the minus 19 meter. We can explore masses at the Terra scale. Uh, for instance, the discovery of the Higgs boson at 0.126 Terra electron volt. And we can study the development of the universe on a scale between uh, 10, femto, uh, 10 picoseconds after the Big Bang to 10 microseconds after the Big Bang. So this is where for the first time uh, such scales become accessible. Now, what I want to show you is a uh, the theory colleague in Frankfurt has made a movie that you can imagine what happens in a collision of two lead nuclei. And what you see here in the picture is uh, the nuclei are drawn in white because these protons and neutrons in the lead nucleus are colorless. And what you will see is that when I let the two nuclei collide, then you see that these colored objects appear. These are the gluons and the quarks. Uh, the remainders of the nuclei fly ahead in the direction. But then you see more and more white objects popping up. And these are the quarks and gluons binding again into colorless hadrons. And if we look at this again, and then you will see that, in fact, there is also on top here a clock running. And it's a clock that runs in femtometer over C. One femtometer over C is the time it takes light to fly a distance of one femtometer. And you see here now we are at four on this scale, at 4.7 or so, everything stops. So the whole process of the two nuclei interpenetrating the quark gluon plasma, forming the quarks and gluons, expanding and then hadronizing again into colorless objects. This takes time, the time that is equivalent to light flying a few femtometers. So a very, very short time, 10 to the minus 22 seconds. Um, now, um, what we do uh, to observe as much as possible about this process is uh, we design experiments, for instance, the ALICE experiment. And here you see schematically the experiment. And here you see a standard size uh, physicist. And uh, so what you should get, I will not go into the individual elements here, is that these experiments are big. Um, they are consisting of many components. I will show you one example in a few slides. And of course, it takes many people to build these experiments because we cannot buy anything. Whatever 
we want to have down to the microchips, we have to design and build ourselves in our university and national laboratory institutes. And uh, today, uh, Alice consists of a little more than a thousand scientists from, uh, there's a zero missing, 170 institutes in, in 40 different countries all around the world, also uh, several institutes in China. And uh, of these 1,030, about 130 are, are in Germany in our institutes, for instance, in my institute in, in Heidelberg. Now, just to give you an idea of the detectors that we are building here, you see the time projection chamber. This is a detector that consists of a volume about 100 cubic meters. So this is the size of a, of a normal room. And it allows to reconstruct in three dimensions uh, about 15,000 tracks of charged particles in one collision. So here you see a physicist sitting inside the detector when it is, while it was being built. And then this is from the outside. And what you see here is mostly the cooling of the electronics. So if we look here, this is a look into the interior of the time projection chamber. Um, what happens is if a charged particle flies through this detector, it ionizes the gas. There is a high electric field. There's an electrode up here, 100 kilovolts. And down here, later when these yellow boards are removed, there are chambers installed that measure the position and the time when the electrons drifting in the electric field arrive. And with this, one can reconstruct for every track about 160 individual space points with a precision of 200 micrometer. And that means we can precisely reconstruct tracks of all charged particles. And how this looks, you will see in a, in a few slides. So this is a photo of our real experiment. In fact, it was taken just a few weeks ago. And this prominent red structure here, this is the iron uh, that returns the magnetic flux, flux from our solenoidal magnet. And the mass of the iron here is about equivalent to the mass of the Eiffel Tower in, in Paris. Uh, here you see a photo of physicists uh, awaiting the arrival of their detector that hangs here still from a crane while it is installed in the experiment. So this, this is now the, the counting room where we observe what is happening underground and we operate the experiment. And uh, this was minutes before the first collisions uh, in Alice at the LHC in 2009, and you see here people are anxiously waiting. Uh, normally, nowadays, there are only about four people in the counting room. That's all it takes to operate the experiment. And this is a picture of one of the first collisions of two lead nuclei at the LHC. It was taken on November 8 in 2010, uh, pretty much one year after the Large Hadron Collider started to operate with protons. And uh, in one of these collisions, these are the reconstructed tracks of all the charged particles. And uh, just if you look closely, you will see they are bent because they are charged and traveling in a magnetic field. They travel on helical uh, trajectories. And from the curvature, we can determine the momentum of the individual particles. And the color, uh, I will come to in a little while, uh, the color signifies how much energy these particles deposit in the detector. And that will tell us their identity, whether they are a proton or a pion or some other particle. And in total, in one collision of two nuclei, 33,000 hadrons are produced. So, so that is what I mean with tens of thousands of quarks and gluons that form our quark gluon plasma in the laboratory. And then they later materialize in these 33,000 hadrons. 
Okay, so now, now let's look what we can learn from our observations. So the fireball that is formed in a nuclear collision is releasing particles, pions, kaons, protons, but also photons. It radiates photons, uh, complex objects made of charm quarks, pairs of electrons and positrons, and the properties of the fireball can be determined by measuring these emitted particles. Now, the first point I want to discuss with you is how can we determine the temperature? And I will show you different methods, explain them in terms of the standard physics you may know, and then show you what we measure uh, for the quark gluon plasma. So the first method is to look at the spectral distribution of the radiation. That means the intensity as a function of the wavelengths. And for the sun, this is in the visible range, photons. Uh, for the universe, it is microwave radiation. And here I show you the spectrum emitted by the sun. This would be the screen line here. The surface of the sun has about 5,700 Kelvin, and uh, looking at this spectrum, we can determine the temperature of the sun, although we are not there. We only see the radiation. This was explained by Planck, by Max Planck in 1900, and the, the density of photons of an object that is at 6,000 Kelvin is four times 10 to the 12 photons per cubic centimeter. Now, the other end of the spectrum in the nature surrounding us is um, the temperature reflected or carried by the cosmic microwave radiation. This is the spectrum of cosmic microwave radiation. And now you see this is not in the visible uh, range, but these are wavelengths of millimeter to centimeter. And uh, this reflects that the universe surrounding us in outer space has a temperature of 2.736 Kelvin yeah, as compared to the 6,000 Kelvin of the surface of the sun. And the density of photons in the universe is about 400 per cubic centimeter. Now uh, that you are prepared to uh, see how one measures temperature from the spectrum, I show you the temperature of the quark gluon plasma. So this is again a spectrum, but started in a slightly different way. Instead of the wavelengths, I have here the momentum of the photons, and I have the number, and the spectrum is plotted in such a way that I can directly look at the slope here and read off the temperature from this slope. So we, we plot a straight line through the points. And if we do this at the Large Hadron Collider, we find a tremendously high temperature, about 300 mega electron volt, translating into Kelvin 3.5 times 10 to, to the 12 Kelvin. So this is 230,000 times the temperature in the interior of the sun. And this is the radiation we see from the core pool plasma. These are really the highest temperatures that can be created on Earth. Now, uh, this was one method. Let me show you the second method. And this is to measure temperature from particle abundances. And uh, this may be a new a concept to you, so let me explain this slowly. Let's assume we have a system, a quantum system that has different energy levels. And energy one, two, three, four, five. And now you ask yourself if the system has a certain temperature, what is the probability to find the system in the state n equals zero, one, two, three, four, and so on? And this probability, or the number of particles in the state with energy En, is given by a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So the 
probability is falling off exponentially with increasing energy. And how steeply it is falling off this increasing energy is governed only by the temperature or the thermal energy encoded in the Boltzmann constant times the temperature. Now, I told you that mass, energy, and temperature are all equivalent. And due to this equivalence, the same applies not only to the occupation of levels at a different energy, but also to the production of particles of a different mass. So if I look at how frequently, sorry, this is in German, how frequently particles of a certain mass, for instance, a pion that is relatively light or a kaon that is about four times the mass or a proton that has about twice the kaon mass are formed, then uh, as a, this is just given by the temperature and I plotted here the logarithm. So the log of an exponential would be something that is just falling off linearly. And if the system is hotter, if I have a temperature T2 that is larger than the temperature T1, then it is just falling off more slowly. And uh, precisely if you uh, express this in terms of what the abundance looks like uh, as a function of the temperature, you, you see it here. So we have a certain expectation if we measure different, many different particle species from their abundances, we can deduce the temperature of the system. And I show you here the result of many different analyses. These are really the thousand physicists working uh, for uh, five, six years to extract how many pions, how many kaons, how many protons, lambdas, uh, baryons with strange quarks, atomic nuclei, neutrons, helium-3 nucleus, this is helium-4. Uh, these are nuclei that incorporate lambda particles, how many are formed and we plot it as a function of the mass. And this is again a logarithmic scale. So you see we cover here about nine orders of magnitude. And um, if we look at this, you see this fall off. And if we analyze this fall off in terms of the temperature, we find 156 MeV with an uncertainty uh, of one. Now, what temperature is this? Here we are looking at hadrons, uh, not at quarks and gluons. And so this, it turns out, it took us some years to understand this, but now we understand that this is, in fact, the temperature at which hadrons are formed from quarks and gluons. So this is the temperature when the quark-gluon plasma fireball turns into a fireball that consists of hadrons that are confined within. And one can do this experiment at different accelerators around the world at lower and higher energies. This is plotted here. This is the collision energy. Um, here is the Large Hadron Collider. This is the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider in Brookhaven. And these are lower energies when beams collide with stationary targets. And what you see here is that with increasing collision energy, the temperature is first going up. And that's plausible. The system is getting hotter and hotter the more temperature you pump into it. But then we are hitting a wall. All of a sudden, the temperature is constant. And this is when the system in truth was at a higher temperature. It was in this quark-gluon plasma phase. But then this is not what we see if we observe hadrons. The temperature we see is when the system turns back to the normal hadronic phase. And so this plot directly shows that there is a maximal temperature that the system consisting of protons, neutrons, pions, and so on can have. 100, if you take all the data together, it's about 160 MeV. And above this temperature, we have the quark gluon plasma. Now, in fact, um, 
this zooms in again on the high temperature, high collision energy part of the, uh, this plot before. And the band here shows the temperature that is calculated with methods of theoretical physics, in fact, so-called lattice gauge theory, um, that is expected or calculated for this transition. And you see that it exactly agrees with what we measure in experiment. In fact, the most recent calculation of this band is narrowed down to one sixth of this gray band and has only the width of the blue point and it goes right through this blue point. So that means that in Ali's we the, this point at the LHC, this lies on the path that is taken in the early universe and this point is traversed, so the early universe comes down here, and this point is reached about 10 microseconds after the Big Bang. Now, I should also point you to this axis. This is a chemical potential. This says, what is the baryon density? And you see here, this is at a very small value, and the meaning of the small value, I will explain uh, to you here. Um, we, this shows the energy that different observed particles lose or deposit in this time projection chamber as a function of their momentum divided by the charge. And you see these different bands, and each band corresponds to a particle species. So down here we have pions, here we have kaons on this band. These are this is, I should say, for negatively charged particles. So these are antiprotons, these are antideuteriums, and what you see here, this is anti-helium-3. And then the very faint line here, there are only 10 points on this line. This is anti-helium-4. So this is antimatter, anti-helium-4 nuclei. Uh, if we, in addition to this energy deposit, also measure the speed at which the particles fly, then we can unambiguously separate helium-3 and helium-4. And if we count them, these 10 nuclei, in the meantime, we have some more, but not many more, uh, what they show, and the same is true for anti-helium-3 and anti-deuterium, is that matter and antimatter are produced in equal portions. There is as much helium as anti-helium-4. And that is the situation, like we had it in the early universe, that matter and antimatter are nearly exactly equal. Now, let me come to method three. And method three is what you would do if you would uh, want to measure the temperature in a gas, for instance, the air in a room. You would look at the distribution of velocities or momenta. So particles are moving about randomly and the velocity of their motion is governed by the temperature. If you want to do this quantitatively, this is what students learn in their first year of physics, then we have here a Maxwell velocity distribution. This is how it looks if you plot how frequently a velocity occurs as a function of the kinetic energy, which is one half in V squared. Then if the temperature is low, this distribution will peak at a low kinetic energy. If it is higher, it will peak at a higher value. If it is still higher, it will peak at a higher value. And the most probable kinetic energy is Kt. So it is given by the temperature in energy units. So, so of course, we can measure now the momenta of different particle species, and we can determine the temperature. And this is what you see here. So this is the temperature expect, extracted from the spectrum of particles, plotted for different types of particles. Again, the same ones we observed the abundance before, pions, kaons, protons. Here we have deuterium, here we have helium-3. And 
um, this is a real surprise, right? These temperatures are very different. Here we see something like 250 MeV. Here we see 1200 MeV. And they order linearly with increasing mass. So, so this is very strange, right? That the observed temperature grows proportional to the mass. Uh, what does it mean? I mean, the, the real temperature in the system is the temperature. It cannot be different for different particles. So what the interpretation or our understanding is that this is the Hubble expansion of the nuclear fireball. So the picture that I already showed you earlier, and I did not comment on the length of these arrows, uh, is the following. The particles are emitted. They are moving more or less radially outward from the center of the fireball. And the velocity grows as we come more away from the center. So the length of the arrows indicates the energy or the momentum of the emitted particles. And the velocity, uh, this picture implies that we have temperature that is random thermal motion, but we also have ordered motion that is given by a collective expansion of the nuclear fireball and the expansion velocity at the surface of this fireball is about three quarter of the speed of light. So this is a tremendously strong and rapid collective expansion. And uh, this is what is, this is the secret that is hidden in the spectra of particles. We have thermal motion superimposed by the Hubble expansion of the nuclear fireball. And we can measure both by comparing the spectra of different particles. Now, the last point I want to discuss uh, with you is how do we prove we have a core pluon plasma? We have seen we have a very hot fireball. There is a limiting temperature for matter consisting of hadrons, colorless hadrons. We have seen the system expands very rapidly, collectively, and that is, of course, uh, driven by the very high initial pressure. But how do we prove that we have a quark gluon plasma? Now, when nuclear matter melts, the quarks and gluons are liberated from their confinement, I said initially. But of course, this hot phase exists a very short time. You saw this in the movie. It exists at the LHC, a time that takes light to travel about 10 femtometers. And so we cannot see the quark-gluon plasma directly in the experiment, but we can see consequences that it existed. And the idea is an early one, and that is that we implant a bound state of heavy quarks, uh, of charm quarks, for instance, they have a mass of about 1.3 GeV, not very different from, from the proton mass. We implant such a bound state in the quark gluon plasma and we look whether it survives. Now this bound state uh, is the 1s state of a charm and an anti-charm quark. It has a mass of about 3 GeV. It has a size of about half a femtometer. So this is the analog of hydrogen in the electromagnetic interaction. And uh, we can, again, like in hydrogen, we can draw a potential for heavy quarks as a function of the distance. And uh, it has here a Coulomb-like part. And then it has this linearly increasing part that is due to um, confinement. That is what we don't have in electromagnetism. This is confinement. And then, of course, in this potential, you have different bound states. You get them by solving the quantum mechanical equation, the Schrodinger equation for this potential. And for instance, this J psi or the 1s state for charm and anti charm quark sits about here. Yeah? Now, the idea of what happens if we have a quark-gluon plasma is sketched here. 
We expect that as the temperature gets higher, this confining part of the potential disappears. And if this part disappears at some point, there are no more bound states in this potential. And the charm and anti-charm don't form a J-Psi anymore. So now when the J-Psi dissolves, of course, the charm quarks don't disappear. They don't vanish. They are still around. And when this quark gluon plasma cools down and it hits the critical temperature where quarks and gluons bind to form the known hadrons, protons, neutrons, atomic nuclei, at hadronization, uh, this is like water freezing out and you get all the different types of uh, crystals that uh, water can form. Yeah? So we get all the different types of hadrons that can be formed from quarks and gluons, and the charm quarks are part of this. Now, most of the time, they will capture one of the very abundant up or down quarks and they form what is called the D meson. But when the fireball contains very many charm and anti charm quarks, then we can also form J psi or charmonia. And we could even form more than we would have had before the melting. No, it just depends on what is contained in the mixture of quarks and gluons. So, so this is looking at the collision at moderate energy, say at RIC, where we form either one or zero charm, anti-charm quarks very early in the collision. Then as the fireball uh, evolves, they normalize, they achieve velocities that are just according to the temperature and they will expand with the system. And then as we reach the critical temperature, these charm quarks show up most likely as the mesons. Now, the same picture drawn for the Large Hadron Collider is that we have of the order, not one or zero, but of the order of 10 charm anti-charm quark pairs. They are formed early, very early in the collision. Again, they normalize, they expand with the plasma. But now if you have many of them, then as the critical temperature is reached and the system hadronizes, we can form shape size. Maybe we can even form several of them. And so if we would look at the violence of the collision, then this quantity says how many shape size as compared to a situation when we have no quark gluon plasma. Then if the shape size, the charmonia just melt, we would say we get less and less the more violent the collision. And this is also what was observed at the relativistic heavy ion collider at Brookhaven. But now our prediction, and that was already many years ago, this is from a paper in Nature in 2007, we say it should revert when we go to high energies. In fact, we should have many more. And if you do um, uh, reconstruct shape size, I show you here how this is done. Uh, they decay with a small probability, 6% of them decay into a pair of an electron positron or positively and negatively charged muon. And by measuring their momenta, we can reconstruct the mass of the particle that decayed into the electrons or the muons. And what you see here is if we look at the total mass spectrum, of course, most of the electrons and muons we measure have nothing to do with each other. They don't come from a, from a shape side decaying, but a very small fraction does. And if we isolate that fraction, you see this peak in mass here is exactly at the mass of the shape side. If we subtract all of this random combinatorial background, and then we can count how many shape side do we have, we can compare this to the situation without quark gluon plasma. And I show you here the final result. So this is this probability compared to no quark gluon plasma. 
And this is the violence of the collision or how many charged particles are produced. When you see a drip, it is less and less. And here is the LHC. Many more. And this many more means, this is now a quantitative calculation, it means these charm quarks are deconfined in the quark gluon plasma and they bind together as the quark gluon plasma reaches the critical temperature and forms atoms. And this corresponds precisely to the predictions for a deconfined system hadronizing. So let me come to my resume. So at the LHC, big bang matter, the quark gluon plasma is formed. We have a first characterization of its properties, and I showed you just a small uh, glimpse. There are many more properties uh, we can measure, uh, for instance, uh, viscosities and, and things like that. Uh, it opens new fundamental questions about the nature of confinement and answers from a rich experimental program in the next decade and beyond that the LHC are expected on these uh, very interesting questions. So let me conclude my presentation and I'm looking forward to, uh, to answer many of your questions. Thank you very much, Joanna. Uh, that was amazing clarity about the temperatures. I really enjoyed that. Um, okay, so there are, we have some questions in the chat. We will take that first before um, the panel uh, comes on. So the, the first one is from Alex from Nanjing University. She says, uh, thanks for your wonderful talk. And it is great for exploring the universe through Alice. And I'm wondering, can Alice be used for other discoveries in our real world? Yes, in fact, to study the quark gluon plasma is one aspect and is not the only one. It was our main goal initially and that is what we built the experiment for. Uh, but uh, we have just realized that we can, for instance, learn uh, in a very direct way how baryons of different types interact with each other. So we know a lot uh, about the proton-proton interaction from nuclear physics studies for many years. But the proton is just one type of baryon and we would, for instance, be very interested to know about the interaction of baryons with strange quarks, lambda particles or cascades. And the reason is that uh, we would like to know what is the interior of neutron stars. There has been speculation for a long time that the interior of neutron stars that is at a low temperature but at very high density could well be made of quark matter. That was the quark matter in the phase diagram that is low in temperature, but five, six, seven times nuclear matter density. And in these situations, uh, we know that uh, we have very abundant, large abundance of strange quarks, of baryons with strangeness. And it depends on knowing the interaction between lambda particles, for instance, on how compressible the matter under these conditions is and how compressible it is, the equation of state, that will determine whether there's quark matter inside neutron stars. So, so that is just one, one answer, but there are other questions like this. So yes, indeed, there is more than just exploring the quark gluon plasma. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, Jan, oh, what is the next? There's another question, uh, which is, uh, and that's from Xu Xiang from South China Normal University. Um, they ask, so the temperature of the matter becomes constant as square root of S goes to infinity. Is this caused by special relativity? 
I did not completely understand what you were reading, but I, what I understood was that the temperature reaches a constant value as the energy goes up and what is causing this. Whether this is something like uh, the velocity asymptotically approaching velocity of light. That's right. right. So, so it's tempting to ask this question because indeed uh, there is a limiting velocity and that is the velocity of light and that is uh, behind uh, special relativity. Now, what is our case is a different one. It's the same that when you boil water, it cannot exceed 100 degrees, right? If you go beyond 100 degrees, you have water vapor. And water vapor can be infinitely hot, can be very hot until you reach a plasma. Uh, the same way quark-gluon matter can be very hot, infinitely hot. In the early universe, it reached a thousand times the temperature of the critical phase transition. However, what we observe when we measure abundances of hadrons is the maximum temperature we reach in hadronic matter. So it is the critical temperature. Yeah? The points we measure delineate where does hadronic matter stop and where do we go beyond into quark gluon plasma matter. So it is really like looking at at water and you see 100 degrees as a boiling temperature and water cannot be hotter, but the water vapor can be hotter. Very nice. Um, okay, I think I don't see any other questions in chat. So we'll go over to the panel and if there are other questions, I'll... Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, now we go to the panel. Uh, uh, first, I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, today, we are so honored to have, uh, you know, several famous professors here. Uh, first, uh, Professor Zhu Jin. Uh, he's a research professor and a very famous, you know, uh, kind of science star in China. Uh, he's a director in the Beijing uh, Platinum. And uh, now he's uh, in a remote place. Yeah, I think I will share some stories here. For, welcome, Professor Zhu Jin. Our next panelist is uh, Professor Hui Chao Song. Uh, was from Peking University. Uh, is a associate professor in Peking University. He's doing very uh, related research, and uh, now he's a superstar now as a rising star in this field. Welcome, Hui Chao. And uh, we also have our, you know, uh, ex challenger as a euro as a apostle from Peking University, uh, Bao Fu, uh, Bao Qi Fu. Yeah, as a uh, very uh, good scientist in this field. Yeah, now welcome everyone here to join this panelist. And uh, I think first we, as euro, we will have our challenger to ask the questions. Bao, Bao Qi, it's your turn. Uh, and, uh, the statistics model is very successful to describe the particle ratios, not only for pions, protons, but also for the heavier particles and uh, the, the charm quarks and also some nuclei. Uh, so I wonder if, uh, if that means the charm quarks and uh, this nuclei also thermalize. Okay, so, so this is indeed a very interesting question you are touching here. And... Um, I, I think in my answer, I have to differentiate between these two. So, so the charm quarks are, have a large mass, right? The mass of a charm quark is about six times the temperature of the system. So the charm quarks don't just pop up thermally, but they are produced very early on when the gluons are colliding. So in the first fraction of a Fermi over C. So, so the charm quarks are implanted into the system, but when the system notices it has a certain temperature, then I think that this observation of J psi and also other hadrons with charm quarks tells us that the charm quarks indeed thermalize. So what do I mean by thermalize? 
uh, maybe for the bigger audience, it means they assume in the plasma a velocity distribution that is given by the temperature. They have this random thermal motion, but of course the pressure in the plasma is, is absolutely gigantic and therefore it expands. And yes, I think the charm quarks follow this collective radial expansion. And of course, then comes the critical temperature and then the charm quark can find an anti-charm quark or an up or a down or anti-up and so on and the charm tape ones form. And so in that sense, I think the observations confirm, but there are other hints for this, uh, that the charm quarks thermalize with all other particles. Now, now the nuclei are much very different and very interesting uh, question because if you look how much, for instance, deuterium is bound, the lightest atomic nucleus, the binding is 2.2 MeV. Nanda knows this very well as a nuclear physicist. And so the 2.2 MeV is much lower than the temperature. And you would think this is the fate of a snowball in hell. You put an object that is 2.2 MeV bound into a heat bath that is 160 MeV. And the question is, how can this be? And, and if you look at the hyper triton, where a lambda is bound to a deuteron, it is bound only by 100 KeV. So, so, what we think is that this is really quantum mechanics, that these nuclei are not formed by a proton and a neutron meeting each other, but six quarks form a compact object that has the quantum numbers of the neutron, right? It has a baryon number of two and so on. Um, but the wave function of the neutron to evolve into this wave function takes time. And the time is given by the ratio of the, the Planck constant over the binding of the object. So, so H bar C, 200 MeV over 2 MeV. And so, so it takes a time that is much longer than the lifetime of the fireball until you have a real nucleus. And of course, by the time this object reaches our detector, which is nanoseconds, then we, we measure an atomic nucleus. But what emerges from the plasma, we think are compact objects that are much smaller and therefore they can survive. So, of course, we are looking for proof for this. This is currently only a hypothesis. And we are thinking hard what to do in the next years at the LHC to prove that this picture is correct. Okay, Bauchi, is this answer your questions? And I think yeah. you did you have other questions? Uh, yes, another question is about the Alice uh, experiments. Uh, I wonder if uh, compare with other groups uh, like CMS and Atlas and LHC, uh, what's the priority task of the Alice and what's the main uh, property of the detector? Okay, so, th so that's a good point. The, the LHC has four big experiments and uh, up to now, three of the four, in fact, were studying heavy ion collisions, Atlas and CMS and ALICE. And in the future, also LHCB, the fourth one, will look at nuclear collisions because they all realized uh, they were initially built for other purposes, but they realized we can do very interesting physics. Now, each of these experiments has different strengths. Alice is built to withstand or to track and reconstruct all charged particles that are produced in a collision within the acceptance of the detector. So, so we can really reconstruct many thousand particles at the same time. That also means that there's a very large amount of data produced. Um, we are talking about um, amounts of hundreds of gigabyte per second. The data that we take in a few weeks amount to a few petabyte of data from these nuclear collisions. 
and we can recognize the particles. So, so we have special capabilities to say, this is a proton, this is a pion, this is a kaon. And the specialization of ATLAS and CMS is that they rely on selecting interesting events. They don't take all events, but they want interesting events. And they are constructed in a way that their optimum performance is for higher momenta. So there are things they can do better than we can. In particular, if you look at jets, for instance, and also if you look at uh, production of rare objects that have large mass or large momenta, yeah, then because they cover a larger solid angle, they discover they cover a larger fraction of four pi, they can do things extremely well. But if it comes to observing particles at low momentum, and we find that for many observables, this is the most interesting region to come close to zero momentum, then this is, this is the area where Alice is, is superior. So there's a very nice complement uh, if you want to look at uh, shapes, charm quarks or B quarks in jets then this is where CMS and ATLAS can triumph. And when it comes to looking at the photons emitted by the plasma, then this is where we are unique. And, and LHCB is sitting at forward angles, and so they cover a part of the acceptance that is special and, and interesting that is, again, complementary. So, so it's nice to have different experiments that have different strengths because then, of course, we take all of the data and the information together to get a complete picture. Okay, great. From my point of view, I'm Alice. I think Alice is the best. <laughs> <laughs> That's of course what I think. <laughs> so, uh, Katie, so Mena, yeah, actually you are experimental in the physics. So you did a lot of work. Can you comment on this? And uh, did you have anything you know to ask for Johanna? Ah, uh, what what I was thinking, Joanna, just out of the not related related to the questions, but if you look at the antiparticles. And if I just look at the temperatures only from the antiparticles, they should be the same as the particles, right? Is, is there enough statistics to do that? Or is that, does that make sense to do that? Absolute, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that is very relevant. So, so in the experiment, we measure, and for antiprotons, we do this with percent precision. We measure the same number of particles and antiparticles. And since we have the same number, we can, of course, also measure the spectra and uh, even moments of the spectra or even fluctuations of particles versus antiparticles. And um, so the spectra are absolutely the same. The numbers are the same. But then we can also look at fluctuations if you have you don't in every event produce exactly the same number of protons, right? In some events you produce more and others less. This is a statistical process. And now we can look how fluctuations of particles versus antiparticles behave. Of course, if you measure the entire system, then you have conservation loss and nothing fluctuates. If you would measure four pi, but if you measure a limited range, then these fluctuations carry very interesting information about the nature of the phase transition. Yeah, people in right. physics know about the phenomenon that's called critical opalescence. If you approach a second order phase transition, then you have a critical behavior. And this critical behavior is hidden or not hidden, is contained in the fluctuations if you look at high enough moments. And that's one of our main goals for the next uh, four or five years, to get from the fluctuations to the nature of the phase transition. And we think we should see traces of the second order phase transition at right. the Large Hadron Collider. So, so physics is really universal and we can 
translate from many scales and see the same phenomena. Thank you. That would be great. Yeah. So yeah, we came to Hui Chao. Yeah. So uh, Professor Song. So Hui Chao, did you have any questions? Uh, I would like to hear your comments whether the quark coulomb plasma has been created in other colliding system, such as PP collision, P light collision, or even E plus E minus collision. Okay, so so then that's an interesting question. Um, so first of all, I think in terms of collision energies probably we produce the quark gluon plasma over a very large range of collision energies. Definitely, we make the quark gluon plasma at the relativistic heavy ion collider in, in Brookhaven. But before that, we were shooting nuclei on stationary targets. So lead beams on a lead target or gold beams on a gold target or even sulfur beams on a gold target at Brookhaven and at CERN, at the HES and SPS. And I think from the data we have, everything tells us that we make the quark gluon plasma there too. We make it at, of course, nuclei and antinuclei are not equal in abundance anymore. We look at different parts in the space diagram, but we go in all of these cases into the plasma phase. Now, Looking at this as a function of energy is one thing, and then, of course, we can ask our, ourselves how small could we make the colliding system, right? If we go to smaller nuclei, we go away from lead, and we go maybe to um, uh, sulfur nuclei, or we go to argon, or we go even to protons, and how small can the system be? And then here I would say, I don't know. Certainly, as we go from a big collision system to a small collision system, many things evolve in a gradual way. And there are only a few phenomena that we do not also observe in smaller systems where the effects are smaller. So, so I would say for of course, a normal proton-proton collision does not make quark gluon plasma. None of the special features we see is observed there. But when you pick out very rare special proton-proton collisions where many particles are produced and that are very violent, they show some of the same features. And uh, I think we have big discussions whether this is a quark gluon plasma or it is just a system that somehow manages to develop collectivity because you have many particles that are produced. I think for E plus, E minus collisions, I'm sure that we are not producing a quark gluon plasma because this is matter, right? And, and matter, you don't have, if, if you have two jets receding from each other, then indeed, in the, if you look at the abundances of particles in the jet, you see some features that reflect the temperature, but you have to make very strong corrections to this. So I think E plus, E minus, and there's also some analysis that is done by a colleague of mine at GSI who looked into HERA data where electrons and protons collide. So. I think these systems are definitely different. When you, you have leptons in the game, electrons in the game, you are not making for gluon plasma. In very violent PP collisions, I cannot exclude it. I think some of our observations are missing, they are different, but this, is, this will be studied in the next five years or so, both at WIC and at LHC. Thank you. Okay, very good. Now we came to Professor Zhu Jin. So I know now you are in a very remote place for observation of the universe. Yeah. So how about your questions that you want to discuss for this exploring? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, uh, it's my yes. I, I think talk is very very interesting and uh, it's amazing that we can see the uh, 
physician can produce the condition of uh, early time of big bang only in the earth laboratory and by the large uh, hydrogen collider. And uh, so I just wonder if, if uh, except for the early time of big bang, but uh, uh, is it possible that we could still using some astronomical observation from some high energy phenomena or, or process, which may also have this uh, uh, such kind of a very extremely high uh, magnetic mag magnetic uh, field or high temperature, and also to get some uh, similar condition like this uh, uh, collider, and to maybe just uh, have also test the, the theory. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I, I think there are two aspects of this question. The one is whether there are many, maybe traces left in the evolution of the universe that have to do with the nature of the quark gluon plasma phase transition um, that we could still observe today. And uh, this is a discussion that I think uh, there we have gone through ups and downs uh, that people claim that certain observables uh, are characteristic for the nature of the quark gluon phase transition. Uh, we, we do not have proof whether anything in the world that surrounds us is sensitive to the nature of this phase transition. Now, the, the other question that you are asking is, um, are there things happening in the universe today that, that mm -hmm. relate to the core gluon plasma? And we know uh, now that, uh, for instance, in uh, neutron star mergers, very high temperatures are created. So, so if we could observe the neutron star mergers with more abundancy and there are instruments being built now that will allow this from very few years from now on, then we can imagine that we will measure really the nuclear matter equation of state at very high temperatures. And that would again relate to this question of what is the interior of neutron stars. So, so people have also speculated whether uh, looking at the uh, slowdown of a neutron star, how the rotation is changing with time would contain information, what the interior is made of, whether we have the superfluid base in the inside. So I think there are a number of interesting possibilities, but so far, we have not yet observed something, but I, I would, I think the neutron star mergers are a very interesting uh, observable in the future once we see not only two or three of them, but hundreds of them. And we would see sort of the ring down signal and how the frequency is evolving uh, over, the, over the seconds. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Very good. Time fly. Yeah, now we came to the last question. Uh, Bao Chi, yeah, our challenger, did you still have uh, other questions to ask? Uh, yeah, thanks for the last question. And uh, it's not related to the talk directly. Maybe it's about the relation between experiments and the theory. Uh, because my my research is mixed focused on the phenomenology and it's based on dynamic model. So I think it's very important to relate the the, uh, the model calculation to the experiment measurements. Uh, but sometimes it's, it's kind of difficult to relate the theory to the experiment side. So uh, can you give some suggestions to the students or the young researchers on the on this aspects from the theory side? Yeah, I, I think that is a very important question because um, what the crucial process, the crucial step is to translate what we observe in the experiment, the spectra, the correlations, the abundances to physical insight. And for this, we need both fundamental theory and we need modeling. Yeah, the fun with fundamental theory, I mean, we have a precise theory of strong interaction. We have a gauge theory that is QCD. Uh, however, to solve it in the uh, energy regime where we are is 
very difficult because the coupling constant is large and therefore it requires very large computers to extract quantities and make precise predictions. However, we, we are very grateful that a number of things that we can observe are now calculated more and more precisely. And it was a huge effort for about three decades to come to this point. And it's not only increased computing power, it is really ingenuity in finding the algorithms and putting the proper interaction uh, or putting thought. And so fundamental theory is not going to be enough. If you describe solid state uh, physics and any bit, many body system like the atomic nucleus, we really need models and we need different tools. And so one very important tool that I have seen develop from when I started in this field in the mid 1980s to today in a real explosion is relativistic hydrodynamics incorporating dissipation. Viscosity, shear viscosity, bulk viscosity. These are incredibly difficult calculations. However, we find that the quark gluon plasma behaves nearly like an ideal liquid. The only other liquid that is similar uh, is very cold Fermi gases at few hundred nano Kelvin temperatures. And so I think there is a lot still to be gained from further developing uh, these tools, because this is the only way. If you want to know about thermalization in the plasma, we really need good dissipative hydrodynamics for a relativistic, for a relativistic system. So I think for for young theoreticians, this is a very rich field. However, we want it needs patience and it needs theory of the same quality as the experiments, and and that is. You, you rarely you have a quick success. Normally, it means you really teams of theoreticians have to work and collaborate for years to come to an important result. Because all the easy things have been done. To describe the really complex data we have also needs very advanced theory, and only together can we really come to fundamental recognitions. Hey, Johanna, this answer, let me think about uh, yesterday, you know, your interview. So your first paper was, uh, you know, takes uh, several years, right? It's a really tough process and uh, it's really high standard. I think this, this was a message to deliver to the young researchers for high standard, high quality research, you really need a patient. Yeah, need calibration, need many, many things. Okay, yeah, thank you everyone, that's great. Today we talk about such very important, you know, research. We listen to the wonderful talk. And thank you everyone for this wonderful panel. Yeah, we uh, really touch a lot of things. Yeah, it's a great night. Thank you, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, Johanna, yeah, actually as, uh, you know, I can ask, we always, you know, deliver our certification to our speakers. Today I de deliver this e-version, you know, to you. I hope I can, you know, uh, met you in uh, person next year. I can deliver this to you. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. And so uh, next week, we're going to have a Professor Yuri Gokotich, uh was from Dresler University. He is going to talk about Maxine. A uh, decade of discovery and its uh, pensions of 2D materials. That also will be a great, great time. time. No, that's week. And uh, so that's the end of uh, today. And uh, thank you all for that. And uh, thank you for staying with us. And next Friday, we met you again on IKX Cox, Connect World and the Universe. Thank you. See you next week.